Hello, beautiful people. You are listening to the Communal Table Podcast, part of Food & Wine Pro. I'm your host, Kat Kinsman. My guest today is a lovely, lovely man who I have known for, I was trying to do the math. Let's just say we've known each other for a <laughs> rather a long time. So I started listening to your music in uh, in college way back when, and you served me a meal that pretty much saved my soul one day. Welcome, Stephen Satterfield. Hi, I'm happy I saved your soul. Yeah, <laughs> I needed every scrap of it I could get. <laughs> I forgot to say that you are the executive chef and co-owner of Miller Union in Atlanta. That's right, Georgia. Yeah, which is Georgia boy, which is the best restaurant in Atlanta, according to your local publication. That is correct. Atlanta Magazine just recently named us number one, and we're a ten-year-old restaurant. Oh my gosh! So I was actually sitting with you the moment you found That's out. Right. <laughs> um, to set the scene, we're sitting at the top of a tower. At that point, we're sitting at the top of a tower in Santa Fe, New Mexico, watching having, the sunset. Yeah, we'd been out to uh, Meow Wolf. That's right. <laughs> Which was a surreal and beautiful break from the day, a good place to just kind of be. Yes, it was a good time. Because in your profession, you don't get a whole lot of time to just be. No, it's funny. I was having a conversation last night with some of my colleagues. I cooked at the James Beard House last night. Congratulations. This is a big um, damn deal. It was a lot of fun. It was a good time, my second time there. Um, But I was saying that I tend to find when I'm at home – I don't take days off. So days off yeah. happen when I'm traveling, and which is kind of a, a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Do you find, so at that point, your husband was with us. And yeah. does is it easier to do when you are forced to do it by outside forces? Well, the, I mean, the, the one thing I have to say is that Miller Union is closed on Sundays, so we always have Sundays. Okay. Like that's that's a that's a thing that you mean happens. like most of humanity. Yeah, <laughs> that's a that's a thing that is a, it's a saying in the restaurant. It's almost Sunday. Mm-hmm. It could be Wednesday, but somebody says that and it gives you a glimmer of hope. Right. Um, <laughs> because we do work tirelessly, and as you know, it's a busy restaurant. There's always things to be done, and and that's everyone's recharge day. So I know I have that when I'm when I'm home, unless I'm doing some kind of event. Mm-hmm. This was a se- this was a Friday that That's we right. were. We I actually was away for the weekend. We were at the IACP conference, which was mm-hmm. a really wonderful conference in Santa Fe. My first time there. And Mine too. It was it was kind of a cool place. I liked it. Yeah, and I like this thing in particular. Uh, it took me out of my head. It let me experience music in a, in a really fun way, and I got to see you. Sort of play around with the sound. Uh, so let's talk about this. I started listening to your band Sealy when I was in college. Yes. So let's talk about how you became a musician and then became a chef. So, well, let's go back a okay. little further in time. Um, when I was young, I was I played classical woodwind instruments. So I mostly didn't know this clarinet and bass clarinet. And I was like the nerdy kid that would go home and rehearse two hours a day and then start my homework. And living in Georgia at the time. Yes. So you fit in. Savannah. In, I grew up in Savannah. You fit in real well. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I almost, I considered going to music school, but decided I couldn't be around those nerds one more day. <laughs> and I wanted to try something different. And, and I was really interested in design and, and, and just culture and everything in general. And, you know, when you're 16 trying to decide what school you're going to go to, oh. what major you're going to take and. I applied to Georgia Tech for architecture, ended up getting in, and I moved to Atlanta to go to school, and that's how I started living in Atlanta. When I got out of school, I started doing internships in the field, and it was when everything changed from working with your hands to working with a computer, Mm -hmm. and I was really disillusioned. I was like, this is not what I signed up for. I knew I wanted to create something with my hands, you know, drawing or, or make a model or whatever, and... And I just, I literally walked away from it and just took some time off to think about what I wanted to do. How many years into it were you? I completed five years of school and got my bachelor's degree. And when I started my internships, that's when I was, I was like, I don't like this. I don't like where it's going. And I I was very impatient, I'm sure. But I had the foresight to realize that it wasn't the right path. And that's when I picked up a guitar for the first time and started playing guitar immediately after I finished school. What was what was that moment like? Did somebody just hand you one and you're like, hey, maybe I want to try one of these things? Or? It was, well, my friend Lori, uh, who went to school with me and ended up being in the band, um, w- grew up playing guitar. So she kind of taught me a little bit like, 
like sofa learning. You know what I mean? <laughs> and um, and I just became enamored with guitar, and I had only had ever been able to play linear notes on a wooden in instrument, and so guitar, it's like all of a sudden this whole new world opened. You can play whole chords, you can play all six strings or one at a time or whatever, and it was just really interesting to me, and I became obsessed. I played every day for hours, and I taught myself how to play, how to write songs, and I basically wrote a record and didn't realize it, and by the time I presented this back to her, she was like, you know, let me add on something to this, and we started forming songs, found a drummer, found a bass player, and then we got we recorded a like a cassette demo and sent it to some labels and one of the labels we sent it to was Two Pure in the UK and they signed us. Oh my gosh. They came to to the states to see us play and meet us and then they handed us a contract uh, the next day. Okay, you just live in the dream right there. <laughs> I, I, I that never happens. No, it's very <laughs> it's it's a very um unusual thing but I think part of what was compelling about the songs was that I wasn't classically trained, and so I just went at it from I went at it from a classically trained position of music, but not of guitar. Okay, yeah. So I was, and I learned how to play symphonic music, not rock music. So I had a different angle. And then later during that time period of playing music, I started working in restaurants. You've told me about a particular place that you worked that a lot of musicians worked at. Because I had interviewed you ages ago about your mentors. Yeah. And you had mentioned Ann Quatrano, who we can talk about some more. Mm -hmm. But then this other guy who would, at least every musician worked for. So there was a there was a restaurant called Eats. It's still there. Eats on Ponce. You, well, next time you come to Atlanta, I'll take you. I would love that. Um, it's very simple food, but it's, it's where all the musicians worked. And it was like counter service. Um, vegetables, roast chicken, and pastas, and like all counter service, very casual, very affordable. Um, and everybody's eaten there. It's like one of those places, it's an institution now. It's probably been there for 20-something years. Um, Bob Hatcher was the, is the owner still, and he was the person that instilled a work ethic in me. I was kind of a, I was passionate about I, I would work hard at things I was passionate about, but working in a restaurant, I had to learn how to be passionate. And he taught me that passion early on. He would do anything it took to keep that restaurant running. And he would bust tables. He would wash dishes, clean the toilets, um, you know, whatever he had to do. And and that's when I realized, like, that's a person that cares. And yeah. that's how I feel now about what I do. So I, I started working with him, uh, under him, for many years. Were you in the kitchen or in front of the house? Well, in that scenario, you kind of worked every place. So mm -hmm. you could work in the kitchen, you could work at the counter, but everybody had to prepare food. It was kind of an interesting setup. And um, and then from there, I just started working in other restaurants. And the more I learned about food, the more I wanted to work under people that really understood the food system and how and worked with farms. And I, it was that cresting of farm to table movement where it was just kind of like a new thing which is funny because it's really how we should always be eating right is, um, is, is this some point in the 90s yes okay yeah and so i i went to work for ann quatrano in 1999 okay let's tell people about ann quatrano here because people should know as i i feel like some people the people who know know but i think she should be sung from the rooftops she's incredible um she is probably one of the most um, influential chefs in Atlanta and has had a restaurant called Bacchanalia for many, many years. It's It was Atlanta's like first um, fine dining restaurant that was really chef-driven and farm-driven. And she still has that restaurant today. It's moved locations two times. Um, I worked for her at Float Away Cafe, which oh, is... Oh, God, I um, love Float Away. It's such a great restaurant, and it was really... Uh, Ahead of its time, it was doing it was doing kind of a more casual version of what the food they were already serving, and it was all you know, wood wood burning oven and wood fired grill and lots of vegetables and like the way everybody's eating now, right. you know. <laughs> and she was doing that in 1999, and it was a really exciting time to work for her. It was really um, I learned so much and that I only worked for her for a year and I actually was still playing music at the time so I had to leave her company to go on tour yeah you and I, I was I was really sad to leave because I that was the job that kind of kick-started me as a chef and started thinking about at, as an actual career and after that 
tour that w- our band broke up. It was our fourth record, and we were all hitting the twenty eight to thirty year old a- ra- age range, and we started to think more seriously about life and what's sustainable. So I joined uh, the restaurant side. I went to the dark side. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking you you uh, like of all the professions out there, and you sort of stack them up least to most reputable. You're a musician and a cook. I know <laughs> that trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, but somehow you have emerged from this to be, you know, you're a person who people look to as being a, you know, a leader in sort of how to treat people, how to conduct yourself in in restaurants, but along the way you've had some really good leaders, sounds like Bob and like are there other people who how did you learn yeah. not just how to be a cook but how to be a leader totally well and i also worked for scott peacock oh for yeah and almost a decade okay and scott peacock also for people who who don't know from watershed from close association with edna lewis mm-hmm. uh if you would explain a little bit about him sure um scott a, another person who is very ahead of his time um and i sought these people out because i saw them making really unique food that stood out with a point of view. And Scott's point of view really is about that traditional Southern uh, farm upbringing and really cooking with the seasons and responding to um, the ingredient by treating it with a lot of respect and very little manipulation. And I, I found that so refreshing because it reminded me of the way my grandmother cooked, but a little more refined, a little more chefy, but not too chefy. Do you know right. what I mean? And that's that's the thing. Like I think it's, you know, a lot of chefs. I I think feel like unless they use five different techniques, they're not really truly being a chef. But sometimes restraint is incredibly understated and and underutilized. And I think that's something that I'm always pushing for. You know, what does does why does it have to have all these things? Like, what three things could we take away, and it would still be great. Yeah. That's kind of how I approach a lot of things. It's editing, basically. Editing. It's editing. But also with with Scott, um, because I think this is important to talk about, that also he was another gay man working in food. Yes. And LGBTQ have always, uh, people have always been a a tremendous part of people who work in restaurants, but it's not something that has really been celebrated always. People have been extremely bullied. People have felt like they had to hide or pretend at work. Uh, you know, Scott was an out gay man, and yes. you know, and did that was was that something that you intentionally sought out leadership? I I feel like I really I really admired the way he um, led because he was a very good teacher. He is a very good teacher, and he's also unabashedly himself like he really is like he knows what he wants and he knows how to get there and he will show you the path and you know there is something about him that really is just he's kind of commanding in a room in a very kind of like just the way he moves the way he you know moves through room the way he works he he really does kind of you you can tell he's in charge you know what I mean and he he has an air about him that is just very kind of um, he's got he's got that special something you know you can't put your finger on it but he's just got this he's got the vision he knows what he wants he can see it he can reach out and grab it and that's something that I really admired about him and finding your own um, point of view I think is really important when it comes to to food or any kind of creative outlet that you have to really know what your point of view is and be and be thematic. I think that's really important. Well, you were saying before about <clears throat> with the ingredients, like sort of the editorial process of it, this this meal that, <laughs> uh, just to <clears throat> set the scene of this, I'd been having a really crappy night the night before. I was trying to get to the airport. Uh, I live in New York, and I was thinking, well, why isn't there a, you know, Terminal 2 here? Oh, crap, I've gone to LaGuardia and not JFK. Oh, no. <laughs> and realized I'd, you know, there had been a lot of traffic, and I asked the cab driver. I was still in the cab. Like, can we just go on to JFK, and I can try to make it? Um, I was trying to get to Atlanta, and you might have had a better chance flying from water to JFK. <laughs> oh, probably. <laughs> well, I made it. I made it in time, but I didn't have enough time to check my bag. And I remember I was running through the terminal, dragging uh, my bag. 
at the same time, the one of the wheels fell off and I lost a heel and I landed on my face in the airport. <laughs> and oh, yeah. and I picked myself up, bruised and dragging my my suitcase, got onto the plane. Weirdly, I got upgraded and it was on one of those really fancy Delta planes. So I just sort of sat there feeling sorry for myself, limped into my uh, hotel. I ended up going that night to Ticonderoga Club, Perfect. which was really lovely. But the next day I was still feeling really bruised and wrenched. like A I little think, fragile. Yeah. And uh, Justin Chapel, my colleague from Food and Wine, and I decided we really needed something like clean and beautiful and lovely and perfect. And we decided to go to lunch at Miller Union. And I got the vegetable plate that, as I recall, there uh, there were beets on there, like really thinly shaved, like, I don't know, if they, the, the sort of candy striper. What, uh-huh. like the, and there was succotash and okra on there and I just still remember this and we were just maybe some tomatoes probably it <laughs> seems like it was it was oh yes because we were in town for the killer tomato festival oh that's right um and I just remember us staring at each other thinking like I am healed and, <laughs> and it was you had not done anything crazy fancy to these vegetables you trusted these vegetables to speak for themselves and they really really did and what did uh, they say they said, just be with me, <laughs> be, be like, be, we want to be a part of you. And I just, and I felt psychically and physically better. And because you trusted those vegetables to just do the minimal amount, you did the minimal amount to them and they just, it felt great. I love that. I think when you eat like a lot of plants in a meal that you feel good, yeah. you just feel good. And I've had so many good meals since I've arrived here in New York for the past few days. So many plant-based dishes. I'm really, ex- I'm really excited to see what's happening here on the, on the vegetable front. There's a lot of really cool ideas and fresh flavors. Well, you asked what the vegetable said to me, and you asked this because you are the vegetable whisperer. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so you wrote a book. Eat me. Eat me. <laughs> Don't do too much to me. Just eat me. There, well, you wrote an incredible book a few years ago. What, what year did it come out? Um, Roots of Leaf came out in 2015, mm-hmm. and uh, it's it's really a book about cooking with the seasons through the lens of fruits and vegetables, and so planning your meal your meals based on what's in season, maybe going to the market and buying what looks fresh, and then figuring it out when you get home. And the book can be a guide for that, and also utilizing every part and piece that you can so you get the full amount of your purchase and the full nutritional value. Yeah, I mean, you're you're so despoiled living in Atlanta. I will say you have an incredible produce uh, access there. We have a, a really great growing season. It's 12 months, um, and we have a lot of growers. There's a lot of new young growers in the Atlanta area, which is super exciting to see, um, and that torch is being passed. And I've been working with local farms in the Atlanta area now for 20 years. And to see these new generations of farmers that have trained under some of these men and women that work tirelessly in the field and have spawned new growers and new farms and new people that are passionate about this, it's really, really exciting to see. And especially in Atlanta, there are younger people of color who are being taught to farm. Atlanta is incredibly diverse. And I think it's a great example of how um, integration of diversity can work in a city. I, I feel like when you go around town that you just kind of see all walks of life, all colors, all shapes, all sizes. And I, I'm very proud of that mm-hmm. in our city. I think we really do have a good bit of inclusion happening and it's in an organic way. Yeah. Um, and so it's really nice to see people, you know, sharing the same space harmoniously in restaurants and public areas and, you know, in entertainment and music and everything. It's just kind of, it's pretty, pretty amazing to, to watch. And you've got a pretty extraordinary resource in the form of uh, DeKalb uh, Highway. Or, sorry, oh, Buford, oh, Buford, Buford Highway, sorry. High Buford. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. We have, um, Buford Highway is the area where a lot of the different um, ethnicities are represented in the food community. And it's old strip malls, basically, totally. that have been yeah. sort of retaken over. That's right. And there's there's um, Vietnamese, Laotian, uh, Korean, there's Mexican, um, I mean, there's Caribbean, um, I mean, just you name it, Jamaican, every, there's so many different cultures represented and you can, you know, try all these amazing dishes on one street. 
Yeah. You know, just kind of, you can kind of hop around. Yeah, I think some my, of them open twenty four hours. Oh God, there's there's a hot pot place in particular that is uh, it Malaysian. No, it's uh, I don't remember what the first name is, but the last part of it is, is hot pot, and it's so stunning, and yeah. it's one of those sort of little malls. But there's also Decalb Farmers Market. Yes, that's, that's where right. my brain had been. Yep. <laughs> doing that. So if you would we have that, me. we have the Decalb Market, which is uh, like a warehouse for um, fruits and vegetables and and meats and and grains, but. Um, and then we also have our local markets, which are spread out all around the city. And in town on Saturdays, I think we have five markets, five mm. different farmers markets. For for our city, that's pretty great. And then there's some that are on various days, like Wednesday, Thursday, Sunday, and in different parts of, of town. Yeah. So uh, correct me on my timeline if I'm wrong here, but you're so you're you were writing the book. You're in the process of writing it. When did you start? Uh, probably started in the the proposal in. 2011. Okay. It takes a long damn time to write a book. Yeah, it <laughs> but, does. But you were you realized during it that you maybe you weren't feeling right or something and you, Exactly. Yes. Can we talk about that? So, I um sorry my phone's going off. <laughs> I didn't. I have it silenced, but it's buzzing. Um I was I actually felt fine, mm -hmm. but I found something that seemed wrong and I, I had found a lump yeah and I had testicular cancer in 2012 um it was funny how I found it I actually was at Blackberry Farm cooking with the Southern Foodways Alliance for their big weekend there in January and it was the restaurant had been open for um maybe 15 months so pretty new and I took a long bath because it was a luxurious bathroom. <laughs> yeah. And I found a lump and I was like, that's weird. I've no never noticed that before. But I didn't really think about it that much. And then uh, maybe um, a couple of weeks later, I just kind of checked it again and it was about double the size. Mm -hmm. And that's when I just instinctually just went to my doctor. I was like, the, literally the next day, I said, something's wrong. And I need to know what it is. And he was like, you know, it's probably nothing, but let's do a sonogram just to be safe. And sure enough, he got the results back, and I was within a, a week in surgery. And by the time, you know, they get the biopsy back and, and do the CT scan, um, I, was, I had uh, cancer that had metastasized into my lymph nodes and my... Um, abdomen and it was starting to go into my chest so into the lungs and so it's it's a very serious cancer it's definitely um deadly if not treated um, but it's also very treatable and mm -hmm. so once I got into you know discussions with oncology and and urology and all the people that consulted on this case which is uh it's actually kind of a rare cancer but it's very treatable um Discovered I had to do a couple rounds of chemo, and and sure enough, it's you know it works like a charm. It's not uh, an easy thing to go through. No. <laughs> uh, in fact, they haven't changed the chemotherapy um, for testicular cancer since the 1980s. So it is a much kind of stronger um, total body experience. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of you know new research has isolated targeted chemo. It goes straight to a certain area, but for uh, for testicular, which is very fast uh, dividing cells, you have to do chemotherapy and you have to do the old school stuff. So it's a lot of heavy metals and makes you very tired and it makes you very nauseated. Um, and so I did. De I definitely learned uh, how to cope and deal with like internal struggle, um, and I also uh, was very happy to lean on some natural remedies that are uh, becoming more and more legal in some states. Yes. What is it th with your state currently? Uh, Georgia is de... Well, the city of Atlanta has decriminalized uh, marijuana if you have um, less than an ounce or something like mm -hmm. that. So they won't send you to jail. Right. Um, and then their medical marijuana is now uh, approved but not um, in motion yet. So that's coming down the pipeline. It's legal here in New York. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you're, 
that is so much for your body to go through. It's and, a lot. And if you are nauseated all the time and all these, I mean, you're a person who food is your career. It's your reason for is getting out of bed. Uh, yeah. it's, your, it's your livelihood. And then all of a sudden it's a thing that makes you feel pretty sick. And you're in the middle of writing about it too. <laughs> True. It was a hard time. I definitely stopped writing the book at that time because I needed to just focus on me. Yeah. Um, but what was interesting is that I did a couple of um, recipes for some magazines during that time. And I had, I was taking a little more time away from the restaurant to heal and go through this process. Um, and so I, I still wanted to cook. It's in my genes at this point. Mm -hmm. So I, I was testing recipes for magazines. There was, I remember one, I did a, um, like a very traditional Southern style, um, low country boil, mm -hmm. which is like potatoes, sausage, corn, shrimp. It's a very traditional, uh, South Georgia thing to do on the coast. And I was, you know, finished making the dish. I tested everything and wrote down all the, you know, appropriate amounts and, sat down to eat it, and I took one bite of shrimp and just hurled everywhere. Oh. <laughs> and oh, I was God. like, I wanted to eat it, but it really just made me so sick. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then you get cravings for things. You kind of have to follow your cravings and just eat what sounds good at the time because otherwise you might not eat anything at all. Mm -hmm. So I had, you know, some weird uh, – I kept wanting, like, spicy food and mm. Thai food. And it was like – my husband was like, are you pregnant? What's going on? Like <laughs> Pickles, pickles ice cream. and ice cream? Yeah. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> but yeah, it was, a it was, a, it was a challenging time and, you know, I lost all of my hair and, and I've lost a lot of weight, which I'm already lean. I don't need to lose anymore. And, and your body goes through a lot. And after that, I committed to taking better care of myself because yes. I realized that I was taking care of all the customers. I was taking care of all the employees and I wasn't taking care of myself. And I was working 10 AM until midnight every day and that's just not sustainable. And so now I have a lot more parameters about when I'm present at work and when I'm taking time for myself. I have a lot more rules. Um, there are certain times of the day I don't check my email and I don't answer any phone calls. And I just keep that time to myself. It's like my quiet time. It's usually in the, in the earlier morning up until about 10. Um, I also started working out with a trainer three days a week, and I love going to him. It's He's part trainer, part um, psychologist, because <laughs> we talk the whole time, and that's part of why I like it, because I'm working out, but I don't feel like I am, because we're having a conversation. Right. And he knows everything about me, and he's seen all my struggles, and you know, he he can see when I walk in, he's like, all right, what do we need to talk about? Do we need to talk about our feelings? You know, because he's <laughs> he wants me to have a good workout. And as soon as I get it off my chest, I'm like lifting better. I have more energy. And, or, you know, he's like, today you need the punching bag or whatever. And it's just <laughs> that vendor. <laughs> yes. But it's great. He, he, um, he's really been a lifestyle change for me that I really appreciate. And, um, it's a lot of fun. I actually enjoy it. I have a good time. So you spend still a lot of time at, at work, and you've learned the hard way that you had to model healthy behavior for yourself. Let's talk about how that translates into the restaurant and setting up a culture at the restaurant that is good and sustainable for the people who work there. Because restaurants are notoriously really, really hard. On, on, on people, but you're, you've decided to do it a different way. Well, I, I feel like it's very important to have boundaries for everybody. It's, it's easy for the overachiever yeah. to <laughs> get caught up in working too much and then starting to hate what they do. And you get rewarded for working too hard at a lot of places. You can. That's true. You're going to be there 17 hours. I'm going to be there 18. Right. And it becomes like a competition with yourself or with other employees. But I try to make sure that everybody has a day off and we're up in six days. So everybody works five, four or five days. Um, there are times where we have to sometimes blur the lines on that when we're short staffed or if somebody's on vacation and everybody understands like that's a, a unique scenario where we, we don't want that to happen. And if it ever does, I walk around with everyone and go to the schedule and say, you know, this is not how I like to do it, but unfortunately I have to do it this week. And I'll make it up to you in the future or whatever. And and people that have been with us for a while, even just hourly employees, or we give them paid vacation. 
Wow. Um, that does not happen very <laughs> and, You know, if they've been with us for a year, two years, like we want them to go on vacation with their family or their loved ones or their friends and not have to suffer for being gone. You know, we, they've spent a lot of time with us. We can take care of them for a week. You know, it's not yeah. for two weeks or whatever it is. Um, and then also I think just – being kind is really important. and it, It's free. It's free <laughs> to be kind and not be a jerk. Well, and, you know, for some people it comes easy. And for yeah. me it does. Like I, yeah. I was talking to my friend John Seibert from Tail Up Goat. And somebody asked us, like, what kind of boss are you? And he, he's like, he's a hugger. And I am. <laughs> I'm like, I, you know, I'm, I'm definitely, like, very generous with my emotions. Um, I'm transparent. I, you, you know, you know what I'm thinking. I'm not hiding anything from anybody. And so... That's really something I think I just have tried to always be true to my team, and I, I'm not afraid to show them my vulnerable side. I'm not to let I'm not afraid to let them know when I don't know what the answer is to something, or I'm not sure what to do. Let me think about it, and I'll get back to you, kind of thing. But I I really do value the team, and I know that they're there because they want to be there and that they believe in our vision. And so I'm just lucky that they're helping me create this, this idea that I can't do without them. But you also can hire for that. Like, yeah. you know, it's, you're not hiring somebody just because they can, you know, brunoise very well or, yeah. you know, have a really good pedigree. So when you're looking, you know, if you, if you do have a position to fill, how do you, Look for that for somebody who is going to sort of support this team, who's going to be uh, sign on for the team culture. And how do you, if you see it, it's not working out with somebody, how do, you, how do you course correct or separate with love? So I think the best employees are a mix of enthusiasm and attitude and skill and aptitude. And so you kind of need a blend. Yeah. Um, but where someone may lack in skill, if they make up for it in attitude and enthusiasm and willingness to learn, and they're teachable, then that's somebody I'm happy to hire because that just means we spend maybe an extra couple of weeks in training and knowing that they're always going to be learning on that long, longer cycle. But we are more apt to keep those people longer because we're – we're instilling the foundation for them and they're going to continue to learn for a while. Um, you know, sometimes people that are highly skilled sometimes think they know everything and then that's not always the best employee. Right. You know, you got to have the enthusiasm. That's really important. Yeah. And it's not just you have a business partner yes. in this as well. So let's talk about how you, how you negotiate partnership, because that's a, you know, that's something we actually talk about a fair amount on this, sure. this podcast there and um, take a sip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, no, see, um, it's hard. It's uh, partnerships it, are hard. For it sure. And it can take as much, we say like take as much work or different kind of work, but the same amount as a, as a marriage sometimes in terms of, of, of time, emotional investment, all these things, because as a person with whom you, you have a lot riding. We do. We do. In fact, we just renewed our, um, life insurance policies on each other. <laughs> <laughs> so you just the... renewed your vows, <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of like renewing your vows. Um, Neil and I, had actually never worked together until we opened up Miller Union. How did you know each other? We, he used to manage a restaurant in my neighborhood that I frequented. And I also was friends with his um, girlfriend at the time, who's now his wife and the mother of his children. And she is also a partner in the business. Um, and, you know, Neil is really, really good at what he does. He is a very... He's a great, great maitre d'. He's a great sommelier and wine director. Um, he's really good with the staff and motivating and coaching them. But he's also intense. And when he's uh, unhappy, you know, it's like you'd stay out of his way. And I, I had to learn how to – we had to learn how to work with each other. I think he feels things very deeply. And when he feels disappointed, you can feel it. To. The whole room can feel it. And I'm a little more internalizing with my um, with things like that. Like I'll I will I will absorb it, think about it, sleep on it, and then come back and talk to the person that, you know, if there's an issue or whatever, right? 
and he's a little bit more reactionary. So we we've actually learned how to kind of curb each other. Yeah. Like he's I've I think I've taught him how to be less reactionary and more um, and to think more about a situation, whereas he's taught me to be more direct and to not shut down. So we've helped each other in this way where we were kind of two different extremes. We've actually helped each other, I think, become better people, better managers, and better um, business owners because we communicate better now. We didn't at first, and it's it's such a stressful situation to open a restaurant, and so much is riding on it. And our first year, you know, you don't even know if you're going to make any money, and we had a lot of people to pay back, and so it just everybody reacts to that kind of stress differently, and now we really see a lot more eye to eye and I think I was just more worried about I have to stay creative I don't want to deal with the business stuff you know and he's like watching the numbers and you know and I almost didn't want to know kind of thing (laughs) and so now I'm like now we just have meshed together in a way that we really fill out each other's gaps and we round each other out pretty well. So how do these conversations happen? Do they happen like in the in the office? Do they happen like on a walk outside? When what what does that look like? That's a good question. Well it depends. Um, I like structured conversations, and so I tend to want to plan and say, let's talk at this, you know, at 3 o'clock for 45 minutes. Whereas, like, he might, he's a little more immediate, so he'll be like, we need to talk about this right now. And it might not <laughs> be the best time, and so sometimes I have to just have to assess, okay, I can stop what I'm doing and come speak with you for a little bit, but I am on a timeline, like, and we have to be ready for dinner at five, so <laughs> right. keep that in mind. Um, but, and then there's other times where I'm like, okay, I have to put my foot down. I can't talk to you right this second. Let's talk at 5.15 after we're set up before the first rush, and we'll work this out, and then he might just stew for a little while until I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. And can the staff tell if there's yeah but you know we bicker all the time we're like a married couple like you said and it's <laughs> like you know we and we probably we probably argue a little bit too much in front of the staff because we're we're so comfortable with each other and i think they're kind of used to it but i don't i don't think we ever do anything that's inappropriate i think it's more just like we are very now very direct with each other and he's not a shy person if if you've ever met neil I have, so yeah. You know, we really have, uh, we have really developed a great relationship and it's, it's been an ongoing friendship too. And we have some of the best times we have is when we travel together, go, get away from the restaurant and actually go enjoy ourselves. We have a great time. We travel well together. We like to eat and drink and we like to see museums and do all these great things. And, you know, we just have, we have a blast. The only thing we don't see eye to eye on is He's a huge soccer fan, and I could give a rat's ass about sports. <laughs> so I just don't care. And I'm sure he has other people in his it's life. It's like a could... religious thing for him almost. Really? Oh, yeah. He's, he's super British, into he? it. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. That would explain it. So. Like, I mean, he doesn't miss a game. If it comes on at, you know, 7 in the morning, he'll be up. Even if he went to bed at 2, he'll be up watching it. Oh, my gosh. Is it ever yeah. on in the kitchen or – not allowed in the kitchen, but Ooh, it's on okay. in the office sometimes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so then you're able to have this freedom to have these conversations. Let's say there's something that needs to be course corrected with a team member. So how do you identify that? And then how do you address it? If somebody, you know, on front or back of house or something, maybe it, you know, it could be just, you can tell that they're having a personal issue or it could be, you know, a service issue. How, what is the best way that you've developed to deal with that? Well, for me personally, I usually address issues with my team in the back. Um, Unless I see something with a server or a front-of-the-house person and maybe Neil's not around. Because we tend to kind of govern our own zones. But at the same time, you know, if there's something that needs to be addressed and it, 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 I mean, it's a pull you aside, let's go talk kind of thing. But sometimes it's more... It just depends on the situation. I mean, like one of my sous chefs, I noticed he was kind of down, and I talked to him a couple of times, and I realized that he wasn't happy any longer, and he wanted to move on. And that's that's a series of conversations led us to that discovery together. And I completely supported his decision to move on because if if we if we couldn't 
we, I knew we were already providing a great place to work. And if he couldn't find the happiness, then it was something he needed to look at yeah. on his end. And that's, that's something that I think is, you know, that's a hard conversation to have. And to, to know when your employee's time is up, you know, and you thought maybe they'd be there longer, that happens sometimes. But um, I like to be direct, but also a good listener and nurturing too. So I want people to tell me like, Hey, what's going on? You know, you seem a little off today or is everything okay? Or, you know, why did you say that to that person? You know, that's inappropriate or whatever. And, and I, I work really well with, I'm kind of like the disappointed dad approach, <laughs> you know, like I really I'm expected, not mad, I'm just disappointed. Yeah. I really expected a little more from you in this situation. I yeah. didn't think you were going to to do that and I my heart hurts just hearing this yeah come exactly out of mouth. <laughs> yeah and it works but and I but that's a true expression of how I feel generally if I if I have to correct someone and pull them aside it's usually like I'm pretty disappointed because I expect more from you yeah and it, I think it works well um you know Neil's approach might be a little different and we have we are dealing with different scenarios you know he might be a, he might be talking to a server that did something with a guest that he didn't think was the right move. You know, I didn't like the way you overfilled that glass or why did you touch her shoulder when you leaned over or whatever. You know, there's like, there's so many different, sometimes you don't even realize some of the things that are going to come out of your mouth when you are disciplining someone. You're just like, I didn't think I'd ever have to deal with this. Like, <laughs> it's like, we don't have kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, like I, I totally get that. It's it's an interesting thing when you find yourself responsible for somebody else's behavior. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, oh my gosh. So when, when you are hiring and you have set up this particular... I love it when you talk about the, the culture that you set up there because it's clearly like a place where you spend a lot of time and you care about it on a more much more than business kind of, of level. And... I, you know, and you were saying Atlanta is such a wonderfully diverse place in all different ways. How do you make it so people of all different walks of life know that it is, that they are safe and welcome to come and work there? Because I know sometimes an effort has to be made even just to reach the people who you might want to come work, you know, who might not think like, oh, I'm welcome to come and work there. This is a place for me. It might not have ever occurred to them. Like, what does that look like these days? Well, that's a great question, and I think we're all still kind of learning that landscape a little bit. Um, you know, when, I, when I'm when i reading resumes, I can't tell anything about the person except for their work experience and maybe some of their education and whatever else that they put on there. So until I meet them, I don't know who's walking in the door. Right. You know what I mean? Um, we do advertise on a kind of a, we cast a wide net in terms of how we, um, you know, get the word out that we are hiring. And so we're hoping that it's going to draw people from all walks. Um, and it just depends. Ultimately, we're going to hire the best person for the job. And like I said, we don't know who's going to walk in the door till we see them. And what we see doesn't really make as big of a difference as what they do once they get there. You know what I mean? How they respond, how they perform, how we interact how they interact with the other employees. Um, and I, I always like to ask a couple of people on my staff when somebody does a stage, hey, what do you think about the stage? Even if they weren't working directly together. Oh, I noticed that they were uh, really polite and respectful of everyone, or they seem to have great knife skills, but maybe a little bit of an attitude or whatever. And they, you and can I'll pick get... up creepster energy from them. Yeah, oh, yeah, <laughs> totally, yeah. Or there are some times where someone's like, <laughs> They're all like, no chef. <laughs> and I trust them. Like if that's right. what if that's how they feel, if they feel like they can't work with that person, I'm not going to hire them because I don't want to put a ripple in the good vibes that are happening at Miller Union. We've got a we have a really really great team, and some people have been there a really long time. Our bartender's been there since the beginning. Oh wow! Uh, we have a couple of servers that have been there for eight years. Um, pastry chef, eight years. Uh, general manager eight years and um we had a dishwasher that worked for nine years for us so that's a long people. tenure for a dish- dishwasher yeah. yeah oh my goodness and then do people have the opportunity to move to another station to to advance to to something like how do they yes know there's opportunity available we when we have a solid team and everybody's 
kind of like mastered their stations. That's the point where we feel comfortable playing Chinese fire drill and switching people around. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a great opportunity for people to learn each other's work and each station, but they also tend to be more helpful to each other too. If one person's really busy and the other, and somebody else isn't, they can run over and jump in and swarm and help. And then it's like, we're a stronger team as a result. So there's no reason not to cross train unless the it's too big of a jump for the person and they're not ready for it. And then that's a that's tricky because you put them in a position where they're not set up for success. And you there's like we have a we have someone now that we're training on cross training on saute and um and she's doing great, but it took a couple of days to like see the okay, she's now she's got it. Right. And uh and there and I think all of us for a minute were like, is she gonna make it? And and you know, let's keep pushing her and and she's now like I I can see now it's like smooth sailing the rest of the way. But it was just the it was like a hard learning curve for her because it, it was a, a little bit big of a jump for her. But I think it was great to see her rise to the occasion and, you know, just super exciting to watch somebody cross a new hurdle and then be confident about it. You know, that's a fun thing to watch. I love that. Yeah. So if you're putting that care into who you're hiring and all that, um, I think there's also more these days a proactive effort in the front of house to let diners know that that they are welcome to to come in. And that's something that maybe restaurants hadn't done in such a deliberate way before, but realizing that, you know, everybody's money spends just the same. That's true. It's so true. Yeah. But I, I've been asking, uh, we were doing a series of interviews last week where I was asking people, have you ever been made to feel unwelcome in a restaurant? We've all felt it. And, but there, uh, for, for one reason or another, how do you let people know who might not be you know traditional fine dining customers for no reason other than they hadn't been made to feel welcome before in places how do you let them know when they get there that like everybody is just as welcome that's a good question i think the best way to to do that just from a owner perspective is to smile and be friendly and you know be open as a as a the person that's receiving them at the door the server person delivering their food or busting the table it's like if they, if there's that you can feel warmth you know yeah. from a staff and 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 then you can tell when it's a little more cut off or cold or or sometimes they're instructed to be robotic or whatever but <laughs> right. we don't, we just tend to to be you know we we have everything you need you know you shouldn't have to think of anything we've got we've got you covered we're you're here to relax you know and that's kind of the vibe i i hope that we're giving off um, but we also do have a little sticker on the door that the folks from Ticonderoga Club created for a lot of Atlanta restaurants, um, and it was um, a little campaign that they did, and it, was, it just says, you are welcome here, and, it, and it's like a little statement about, you know, we include everyone, and everyone's welcome, and it was at a time where that was being questioned a lot um, in the past couple of years. Yeah. And uh, it felt great to put that sticker on the door and a lot and to support them and and their passion for wanting to unify the Atlanta restaurant community to be all inclusive and welcoming to all of our guests. And I, it's it's um, I think we have a really good food community down there. It's very special. Everybody is pals and we all support each other. We go to each other's places and, you know, it's a great farmers market scene and. It's a it's a a, a really nice um, supportive food scene. Everybody has each other's back for sure. I've always picked up on that, and if we can spend another moment on Ticonderoga Club, because I that was a place where after I'd you know fallen on my actual face yeah. <laughs> and gotten to your town was limping, I was on the phone. I was on the phone or texting with our friend Jennifer Vashtaikol, uh-huh. <laughs> a woman who uh, op- whose opinions I trust tremendously when it comes to restaurants and many more things. And she said, "Get yourself to Ticonderoga Club, and you know they'll they'll take care of whatever ails you." And I got there and I didn't have a reservation. I just sort of rolled up there. It turned out the woman at the hostess stand was also a member of Southern Foodways Alliance, and she mm-hmm. said hold on one second. And they made a space for me at the bar. Like I think they sort of added one little thing there. And I just felt 
so welcome and taken care of. Yeah, and they're good at that. I really needed that. You had a very particular occasion at Ticonderoga Club. That's right. I just love this story. Can you please tell it? Yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, my partner at the time, Ben. Um, You've been together how long? We've been together for 30 years. <laughs> but we just got married in, um, in 2018. So, no, I'm sorry, 2017, December 2017. So um, we were going to just do a courthouse quickie and then have uh, lunch. We had lunch with our families. We were going to the courthouse in the afternoon, like one of those group things. Where right. There's like six couples. And then we were meeting some friends um, later for dinner. And as it turned out, it was December 8th, uh, there was a – snowstorm that came in to Atlanta, <laughs> which is not a common occurrence. No. And uh it just started it was literally a blizzard. Like it was it was many it was probably twelve inches of snow, which is very unusual that for never the South. Happens there. Um as we're having lunch in a nearby place, um we're seeing, you know, that the city and the county are shutting down. The schools are, you know, all the schools have been closed and whatever. And so there was no – we our plan to go downtown and go to the courthouse was completely thwarted by the weather. And we started scrambling to think of a new idea. And Neil, actually, my business partner, texted me. He said, you need to talk to Greg at Ticonderoga because he's Greg an ordained, <laughs> ordained minister. And so we got in touch with him. And this was about 1245 or so. And he said – I was like, we were going to do this at 2.30, and, you know, I don't know if you can pull this off, but we're just a little bit desperate here because we're ready, <laughs> and we want to, like, make this happen. And it, we had friends that flew into town, and it was a Friday night. Um, so we, he said, give me a couple of hours, and can you just meet here at the club at, like, 4.45? So what was so funny was that Crog Street – Market is where Ticonderoga Club is located, and it's a, one of Atlanta's food halls. And the whole place had shut down, except for Tea Club was open because it's a bar and it's snowing, and people are going to go to the bars. <laughs> right. And um, so they had set up their little area that meets the market into a little chapel, and they put a little altar, and they had some like fun little like um, it was around Christmas time, so they had all these little like. Christmas ornaments and decorations on there and our families that that were in town and just having lunch with us stayed a little bit later and came to the ceremony and our friends who we were only going to meet for drinks and dinner we asked them to come a little bit earlier and we said meet us at this place so we had a very very precious group of friends and family converging together and we were married by Greg at Ticonderoga Club. And so that's our um, that's our wedding chapel. That's hospitality. Yeah. Right there. It was super fun. To turn your bar into a <laughs> chapel for people you love. Oh, and the best part was the um <laughs> the so in the in the market they had closed down, but the music was still running in the food hall. <laughs> and um Ben, when he said his vows, this, there was a song playing in the background, and it was just an old-fashioned love song. Oh. And then when I started to say my vows, Funky Town came on. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a pretty good summation of our personalities. <laughs> <laughs> he took you to Funky Town. <laughs> you took him by That's so lovely. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, Georgia. We talk about Georgia for a sec. Uh, do we have to? <laughs> a little bit. That's got to be challenging right now. It is. I know that uh, it's hard for – it's risky for restaurants to take any kind of political stance on on things and stuff. And I, and I know that – Sometimes, like, I, I know that films and, uh, you know, the TV industry are maybe pulling out of Georgia some, but then you're ending up hurting the people who make a living there who are not trying to take your rights away. So exactly. It's a complicated issue. Um, and we're talking about the heartbeat bill, which um, uh, our governor of Georgia um, passed. And we, you know, many of us that are concerned about human rights and 
women's rights and the rights to govern our own bodies um, are really upset because this bill means that by the time you detect that you're pregnant, it's already too late to have an abortion. And that's not a logical way to make a decision if that was an unplanned pregnancy. So obviously abortion is a very personal subject and it's different for everybody. And, and, you know, pregnancy is a, is a difficult thing to go through, whether it's something that you wanted to do or not. And, and so it's, and I can't speak to it because I don't know, but I would just say that it is a very frustrating time um, because it is, it does hurt our, the perception of our state and, and, you know, we are Hollywood East. There's a ton of films and television produced in, in Atlanta and state of Georgia. And a lot of people are threatening to pull out if they haven't already. And, you know, I, in some ways I don't blame them because I think if they do that, it might, maybe there'll be some kind of reconsideration or some kind of repercussion, but maybe it's just going to hurt even worse. And so, and you know, we get a lot of that business. A lot of people have their cast parties at Miller Union. Uh, we get a lot of, you know, of these folks that are stuck in Georgia for six to 12 months working on a show. We get a lot of those, you know, famous actors coming in and we also treat them with a great amount of respect and keep their anonymity. <laughs> and we, we usually tuck them somewhere with their back to the rest of the dining room and right. take good care of them so they, they know that we are good about ushering them in and out quickly. The um, thing is you're the number one restaurant in Atlanta. <laughs> Everybody wants to be there. So, um, you know, it's it's really tricky. And, and, and also just the governor race was tough. You yeah. Know, it was, uh, it was as a, nationally watched. It was really sure. um, a, a critical time in our state. And it's hard. You know, I, I don't like talking politics in the dining room. Yeah. I really don't. And I, I won't do it. I We can do it here because yeah. we're... We're, we're, this is a good place to talk about it. But in the dining room, I feel like it's not appropriate because yeah. I think we don't know people's stance and they're just there to have a good time and we don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Just like we need to welcome everyone. We need to welcome everyone. Yeah. I just wanted to address the ripple effect of, of taking business out of places because it ends up, you know, it's a, it's a tough one because then there are people who are servers at restaurants say, and, and they still have to make a living. Yeah. Or just the people that work in the film industry that are suddenly getting less work Yeah, and they live in Atlanta, you know, the people that they get hired on to these jobs. So I enjoy yelling at politicians. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really, really fun thing to, <laughs> to yeah. do. Yeah. Um, but I know I was just thinking like as a, as a, a proud son of Georgia, <laughs> you yeah. might've had some feelings about that. You know, and it's funny too, cause I've, I've lived in Georgia my whole life and Atlanta is really um, an oasis in the state and it's a great state. And I grew up in Savannah. It's a beautiful city. Um, but there's, you know, there's a lot of different types of people and a lot of different ways of thinking. And, um, you know, I, at the same time, I've got a lot of hope for the state. I think that we've seen some positive things and this is just a setback and hopefully we'll see more positive change soon. Let's hope people can work some stuff out over succotash. <laughs> yeah, I, that's the thing. If they, if I can feed them and then convince them to do something, <laughs> maybe I could try that. I think you could cure the world with your okra. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! So, do you have another book you would want to talk about? Maybe, possibly in the ether, um, maybe, or is this just something I'm trying to will into being? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to will it into being. Yeah. Um, no, I am working on a proposal. Oh, and, I've got everything crossed. Um, but it's it's a little under wraps right now. But um, okay. it's definitely something. Thing that is in the future future okay I'm um, still working out the the kinks on a on an idea but I'm excited about it I'm very excited about it I'm just damn happy that you are here to say all of this and Thank you. to get to make the food that you make and yeah. and I'm just eternally grateful for you. Yeah, thank you. I'm I'm grateful for you too. And I have some questions that I ask all the guests. Okay. Don't think too hard. But this is the moment I always say like the Oprah moment where I believe if there's something you really want, you should say it out loud so other people can help you get there. What is the entirely selfish thing that you want? Hmm. I mean, I 
I really am trying to find a balance where I can be present and at home more and enjoy my personal life a little bit more reciprocally to my work life. And so that's what I'm pushing for for 2019, 2020. I want that for you. Thank you. Dear people, leave <laughs> leave Stephen alone. Go to his <laughs> restaurant, leave him alone. <laughs> so what is your comfort food? God, I mean, I know it sounds weird, but like a salad, I swear. Yeah. It, it'll bring me back to life. Is it one you make when somebody else makes? Do you go to Any salad kind of salad. Chain? Just like really? some, some great, a good salad. Not any kind of salad. I mean, like we were just at Roberta's and we had oh, those we had all are the so salads and there were and I, I we had a large table, a lot yeah. of people, and there was one of each and I was like, we're gonna need one more of each of those. Right. Like I know that I'm gonna eat half of one of those bowls, so there's, keep them coming. There's stuff like Punterelle that they have. Yeah. They're really good on the bitter greens. Oh, I love it. Oh, I love yes. that restaurant so much. Yeah. So what is the last meal that you had that made you emotional? Hmm. That's a good question. I know I'm thinking too hard. I mean, well, I think the last meal that made me emotional, it was it was this weekend at uh, Missy. Oh, and, she's so good. Missy Robbins' yeah, place. But it was really, I mean, the food was fantastic, but it was more about the camaraderie and the ability to share the table with so many great people because... Uh, all the folks I cooked with from uh, at the Beard Foundation um, last night, from Coquette and Tail Up Goat in D.C., Coquette in New Orleans, and um, Long Oven in Richmond, um, it was just great to be at the table with them and to just raise a glass and share a bunch of food and share stories and all of us being away from our restaurant for a minute. It's those moments are really cherished. And, they, and I was I was emotional at the end. I was. They also have really great salads there. <laughs> oh my gosh, we oh. had every single thing. I would have like fifteen of each of the, yeah, <laughs> those. Yeah, salads. Good. And also, they set up such a great team culture there too. I've sat down with Sean Feeney uh, before, and talked through like you know what they're doing for for their people there and keeping them physically and emotionally healthy. Nice. And, yeah, and they're got some really progressive. And Missy, I know Missy's very aware. Yeah, and she's yeah she's I, gone through a lot. And has really I, changed some things. That's she great. and I've been a fan of her since her. I used to work upstairs from Ovoche, so it's been such a joy to see her food, which I loved then, to just evolve and to see her take care of herself and and yeah. be healthy has been a pure joy. Yeah, that's great. Like somebody whose food you already love, like yeah. getting even better. I've been really impressed with New York so far. Every meal I've had is a lot of vegetables. I mean, it's partly the places I'm choosing. Yeah, but I mean. I've had so many vegetables at every meal, and I've been super happy about it. That makes me happy. Well, also, chefs are, like, right at this time of year, like, in New York, are very like, oh, my God, it's not just potatoes at the yeah. green market. no more turnips. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, yeah. So everybody is going, like, you know, ramp morel fiddlehead. Yes. <laughs> All that kind of stuff. Or maybe we're a little bit past that, but fava crazy. Yes, absolutely. Like, super much. What is the last meal that somebody made for you at their home? I don't know. People don't like to cook for chefs. I mean, I'm <laughs> trying to think about that. Oh, it was uh, my friend Lori Skako's mother made. Uh, she's Lori is from Staten Island originally, but her parents live in Marietta, Georgia, which is outside of Atlanta. And she was home one weekend, and her mom found out about our marriage, and she wanted to have us over and some friends. And she made. She's a really great cook and made pasta and you know just like all the italian things and oh, and and we sat outside and uh, on their screen and porch and just had like an incredible meal that she had probably spent three days on oh. and made enough for 50 people <laughs> did you take some home and oh absolutely <laughs> yeah her peppers and crumbs what? the like she had like three different kinds of pastas wait what's peppers and crumbs it's just I'm this, the worst italian ever it's this dish she makes that is like marinated peppers like she marinates them herself and then puts like olive oil breadcrumbs on it and bakes it and it's like all the juices from the peppers and the crispy crunch of the of oh the God. crumbs i bet missy has a version of it 
<laughs> I, I can't tell you how badly I want that right now. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> it's good. Oh, So because you're a music person, mm -hmm. what living musician would you want to cook for and what would you cook for them? Say this person comes in the door of Miller Union. You didn't know they're coming in. There's somebody's guest. Oh, that's, there's so many people I want to cook for. Um, well, I just saw Wise Blood. I don't know. At um, They played in Atlanta recently, and um, the whole band is great, but the, the woman, she's a female singer, just incredible, um, incredible songs, and I would, I would definitely want to feed her. What would you feed like, her? I was almost like slipped her note, like, come to lunch at Miller Union tomorrow, <laughs> and I'll feed you. Um, I don't know. I think I, I just think that I would, I would just want to like fill the table with stuff and let her eat what she wants. What is on the vegetable plate right now? Uh, right now we have, um, some grilled squash and vidalias with peach. We have. That's Georgia as heck. <laughs> yeah. We have, um, some simple sauteed greens and we've been getting still a lot of kale and chard mustards. Um, we also have. We just changed some things the, right before I left. Uh, we also have um, potato, uh, fingerling potatoes with shishitos. And we just added sliced tomatoes. Oof. Uh, believe it or not. Is yeah. it a good tomato year? So far, so good. <gasps> and the peaches. I brought peaches with me to um, the Beard Foundation. And oh, because last year was a dicey peach year. Oh, they're good this year, honey. <sighs> Let me tell you. I, I brought the spring flame peach. It's a red skin and a slightly, um, it's like a peach color with a red interior around the pit. Um, Serve that with Benton's country ham and pistachio butter oh as my, my canapé. <laughs> and the peach itself could have been good just on its own, but it was nice with a little bit of salty and fatty you're killing me <laughs> um but yeah there and you know okra's right around the corner and we just all saw the first eggplant like it's summer in atlanta oh. i mean it was 98 degrees on memorial day oh my god so summer starts memorial day weekend and it ends in october <laughs> that's I, that's our summer <laughs> i was just there for about 16 hours i think i need to go back <laughs> and last question and i I wonder if I know the answer to this. You have five uninterrupted minutes for self-care. What do you do? Five uninterrupted minutes. Yeah, like nobody's calling you, nobody's. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just five minutes, I would probably just, I, I'm kind of addicted to this little word game, and I, I like to turn my brain off and but sharpen it. It's so like turn my brain off from all the things I'm worrying about but keep it moving and sharpening it. And I've been playing this like wordscapes game where you just, it's a, it's like a crossword kind of thing, but um, it's, I like to do it real fast. So like I, for, if I had five uninterrupted moments, I would probably be doing that. And then the slightly longer time, what would you do? Um, if it's in the afternoon and I can pull it off, I would take a nap. <gasps> Ooh. Naps. I thought yeah. you were going to say, you had told me once about a, a, a massage place. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. oh um, well, there's two in Atlanta that I like. There's one called um, Jeju, which is... That's the one you told me that's about. The, that's the one that's the Korean spa that you could you can actually like stay there all day. And it's kind of like the 10,000 Waves place that we were talking about in um, Santa Fe. But anyway, it's it's incredible. And you can eat there. You can sleep there. Like You could be there for days. You could hide there and nobody would find you. <laughs> Um, and then there's another place that I go to that for a quicker fix and it's like a foot, foot place, yeah. you know, the foot massage, which is always really pleasant. Dark room. Next thing you know, you're snoring. <laughs> <laughs> you maybe want peaches and naps. <laughs> and that That's the name of my new book. Peaches and naps. I love it. I would, I would buy the very first copy of that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming in and, and for your time. And people, if they want to find you on social, it's Miller Union Chef. At Miller Union Chef and at Miller Union ATL for the restaurant. Yeah. And if they want to buy your book, it's Root to Leaf. Root to Leaf. A Southern Chef Cooks Through the Seasons. Yes. Buy that. and. Let... Oh, I also have the Short Stack Edition Peanuts. Oh, yes, you do. Yeah. Oh, so find all of those things because they're wonderful and highly cookable. That's and... true. Tested. Yeah. Recipe tested. Really. Buy out that first book so he <laughs> there's huge demand for him to write another because the world... <laughs> needs another book from Stephen Satterfield.
Thank you so much for being Thanks here. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Yay. Thank you for to our uh, <laughs> thank you to our producers Jennifer Martinick and Alicia Cabral. Thanks to Douglas Wagner for our delightful theme song. Maybe for season two you write our theme song. Okay. <laughs> if you like what you heard, please tell a friend, write a review, or rate us. And those reviews and those comments and subscribes and all that kind of stuff really, really help people find us. If there's something you'd like for us to talk about or a guest you'd like to hear from, please let us know. You can find me on Twitter at Kitten with a Whip. Find out more about the show and catch up on all the episodes at foodandwine.com and Food and Wine's YouTube page. Thanks for listening and take good care of yourself till the next time. Eat peaches. 